For many people in the west of England, 1966 was a stimulating year of change. In Bristol, Concord went into full production. Bob Dylan was shocking audiences at the Colston Hall. And in June, the Labour Party won a general election. And, of course, it was the year of the Football World Cup. But for some people in Bath and Bournemouth, Glastonbury, Templecombe and Midsummer Norton, the year is remembered with a sense of loss. Their beloved railway that connected the Bristol Channel with the English Channel was closed. Since then, there's been an outpouring of literature and song commemorating the lost line, born on a wave of nostalgia for a way of life that passed into history. I want to discover, was there a kind of England that died along with the Somerset and Dorset Railway? <laughs> The S&D, as it was known, was always a railway for work and play. It moved local produce like coal, shoes and stone, as well as people, many of them going on holiday. It was a through line to Bournemouth. Bath, they built Green Park Station with a lovely facade worthy of this magnificent Georgian city and a fantastic wrought iron and glass single span roof. And today it still feels like a railway station, with the single difference that there are no trains. And so if I'm going to follow the Somerset and Dorset, I'm going to need some wheels. And so to begin my journey from Green Park Station, the greenest mode of transport. When people heard that the railway was to close in March 1966, amateur filmmakers came from far and wide to document the S&D. I've uncovered some of their shots that best convey the character and charm of the line. In 2013, the section from Bath to the first two tunnels became a cycle path. With a gradient of one in 50, it's a steep climb, and for me at least, hard going. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Michael. Jeff Akers worked on the line until shortly before it closed in 1966. <laughs> it was hard work coming up that hill. What was it like bringing a loco up? Hard work. You had to get your fire right, you see, because it was belching out black smoke, and yeah. you didn't want that, if possible, in the tunnel, because, of course, you had to drop to breathe in here. <clears throat> These tunnels are not ventilated in any way? No, not ventilated at all. Why is that? Uh, the big tunnel wasn't ventilated because the, the, the surface uh, above the tunnel was too far up, something like 300 feet, so they couldn't, they couldn't shaft it. It was the longest single-line unventilated tunnel in England. Obviously, then, the smoke just pours down the side down, of the Down the side of the tunnel and was sucked into the, sucked into the cab because it had nowhere to go, really. If you'd come into this tunnel, still with a lot of steam, a lot of smoke, mm -hmm. what would have been the effect on you? Uh, very hard to breathe. Yeah. We would have been down virtually on our hands and knees in front of the firebox with a wet cloth over our, our face, which was the 
place on the footplate, which was the most free of smoke. We was breathing, but it was choking with the sulfur. As soon as we reached the other end, both of us put our heads out of the cab side, and all of a sudden, we was getting wet around the back of the neck because the steam had got in there, condensed into water, and it was like a small waterfall inside the cab with it all dripping down on us. These days, we tend to glamorise the 1960s and forget that jobs like Jeff's were hard, dirty and dangerous. They played you up, they could bite, they could burn you, they could scold you, and this is all, all what you took, all what you took in the day's work. Every day was different, every day was a challenge. You're describing different times, you're describing a different world, aren't you? <laughs> it was indeed, it was indeed a different world, yeah. The fireman and the locomotive driver, half asphyxiated in those long tunnels, would then be rewarded with this, the arrival at Wellow Station and the beautiful Wellow Valley on the very edge of the Cotswolds. And now I begin to get the point. I understand the charm of the Somerset and Dorset, this wonderful landscape. And just imagine it with a locomotive puffing through it. The s and beauty attracted many amateur filmmakers and photographers. The magnificent work of one of them showcased the railway to thousands outside the area. And he pursued the trains in style. Riding along in my automobile. My Ivo Peters died in 1989, but his Bentley is still going strong. It's now owned by a long-time admirer, Julian Burley. From a bicycle to a Bentley, things are looking up. This was Ivo Peters' Bentley. Did you know that when you bought it? Yes, I did. I specifically tracked it down because it was such an iconic car. It's arguably the most well-known motor car associated with our railway heritage. I wanted to try and obtain it and take it back to what Ivo used to do 60 years ago, and that's chase trains. And he was very prolific, wasn't he? How many images did he produce? I'm told that he took some 14,000 still images, uh, largely black and white, uh, and seven and a half miles of cinefilm. When he was composing a shot to include a train, more often than not, it included the car. And when uh, locomotive crews used to see the Bentley, either on the road or at a station or whatever, they knew they had a race on. <laughs> because he was trying to keep up with the same train all the way down the line. Indeed he was. In his youth, he was a racing driver, so this car was put through its paces all over the country. Oh, one had great fun chasing trains and seeing how many times you could photograph the train uh, between, shall we say, points A and B. And uh, more often than not, the crews on the locomotives were fully aware of what you were doing. And they would more or less say, uh, right, we'll try and see if we get to Marsby Summit before Ivo does. In its time chasing trains, the Bentley covered 120,000 miles. But Julian and I are heading to one place that even the intrepid photographer could not have reached. This is the magnificent Charlton Road Viaduct, the largest structure on the line. Let's take a look. An exciting moment for you, Junior? This is extraordinary. Ivo would be looking down from his cloud in astonishment. Never in a million years would he have ever thought that his car would be on top of probably the most iconic structure on the whole line. Because not only do you have the Bentley on the viaduct, I think for the first time ever, but it's been photographed and filmed and even an aerial shot. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's a wonderful record. It's another 
piece of the jigsaw that it's now its history and um, we've done some wonderful things and crazy things with it over the years but this has to be one of the maddest. The legacy of Ivo Peters is his wonderful visual record of the line. He was not the only one taking impressive photographs. And Picard's father was so enamoured by the railway that he bought a house alongside it. This is a photograph of the Pines Express. And it was a wonderful train because it took people right down to the south coast. We were going somewhere new, somewhere different, and off to have fun. Taking families like Anne's on holiday was a huge part of the work of the S&D and another reason why it was so popular. Families relied on trains, including the Pines Express, to take them from cities like Manchester and Sheffield to holidays on the south coast. And so off you went with your buckets and spades. Yes. Sandwiches for the train? Oh yes, always a packed lunch. Mum had done a packed lunch for us, yes. Burma's flask? Yes, yes, before we'd even got as far as the Devonshire Tunnel, can we have our lunch now, please? <laughs> Eventually we got to the other end and just uh, had family fun by the seaside. And you were always at the height of fashion. <laughs> Not quite with that. <laughs> At the end of the line was Bournemouth. Here comes summer, school is out, oh happy day, here comes summer. The South Coast Resort, complete with exotic gardens, sand and sea, and even trolley buses, was immensely popular in the 1950s. And let the sun shine bright on my happy summer home. But by 1966, Britain was changing. Package tours to Europe were taking off. And in April 1966, Lord Bath opened Longleat Safari Park. It signalled a new style of holiday attraction. There was no chance of seeing the lions of Longleat from a train window. A car was essential. The photograph taken by Anne's father of the Pines Express was especially poignant. It was the last time that it ran. Discontinuing the through trains was the beginning of the end for the S&D. Lots of people came to the bottom of their gardens to wave the last train off, stood on the bridge. It was very crowded, I do remember that. and. Um, a sense of loss, really. It's gone. I think my parents saw the writing on the wall. They knew the railways were going to close in our area, and uh, so they did take driving lessons and learn to drive mm. and save up for their first car in the mid-60s so that we could still go down to the coast. So they're absolutely part of that transition, aren't they, where people had to... Mm. get a car, but also as people got cars, there wasn't so much need for the railways. One world elbowing the other world aside. Hello, conductor. Hello. Uh, I'm going to the museum at uh, Radstock, please. How much is that? In 1966, that would be four old pets. I'll settle for 1966 prices. There we go, sir. Yeah. From a Bentley to a bus. Ooh. There you are, sir. I'm coming down in the world a bit here. But it was buses like this one, built in Bristol in 1948, that were expected to take over from trains as lines closed. This one is taking me to the long-gone Somerset coalfield. I'm meeting amateur filmmaker Andrew Linham and Bryn Hawkins, who started work underground aged just 15. After through passenger trains were taken away, the S&D came to rely more and more on local goods traffic, especially coal, much of it bound for the Portishead power station. The film is showing us this extraordinary thing, the, the so-called incline, uh, unmanned coal wagons being hauled up and down with cables. What, what, what's going on there? The heavy wagons, loaded wagons, are going down and they're pulling the empty wagons up. I can remember going out there several times and we had to get acetylene cutters out there because the, the chap on the top had not attached the loaded wagon to the cable. 
so it careered all the way down and smashed up down the bottom. So we had to go down with the settling cutters to cut the wagon up because it was in the way. Coal mined up in the hills was brought down in wagons to the railway lines in the valleys. The man on the top had a, had a, a big brake that he used to use to try to slow the wagons down, but it was a bit of a job. Was the brake man in danger? No, he wasn't in danger. It was the poor chaps down the bottom that was in danger. Uh, certainly if the wagons actually ran away. Andrew, steam locomotives hauling open coal wagons and unmanned wagons up and down the incline controlled by cables. This is a different world that's passed away. Why did you feel you wanted to make these movies? I thought it ought to have to be captured. My father said, you know, the devil, you ought to be up filming that, because it's going to be gone soon. So I dusted off the cine camera and set about doing it. Do you think in those days they could conceive of coal that wasn't being moved by railways, or of railways that weren't moving coal? Not at all. It's what they were built for. Andrew's father was surely right to urge his son to film these extraordinary sights. 1966 saw the closure of Brins Colliery at Norton Hill. Six years later, the coal field shut down completely. Just as s and passenger traffic was slipping away, so was goods traffic. Leaving Radstock and its coal field, the railway climbed again, this time for almost eight miles to Masbury Summit at 800 feet. Another tough call for the resolute fireman. From there, it was downhill onto the Somerset Levels and the branch line through Glastonbury. Glastonbury is where the story of the S&D began. And it all started with shoes. Clark's shoes. This fascinating museum in Street near Glastonbury is on the site of the factory established by James and Cyrus Clark, first making slippers and then footwear in general. In the 1850s, James pressed for a railway to bring coal into the factory and to get his shoes out. I'm here to meet a couple of ladies who in the 1960s came to the factory shopping for seconds. Esther, what would take you all the way from Bristol to Street to buy shoes? Because the price, is, the price was right. I was bringing up four, four girls and shoes were expensive. Tina. Were you buying for kids or for yourself? For myself. And what sort of shoes did you like to buy? Monument Eels, that white one. Very pointy shoes. Pointed shoes, oh. yes. Were they, were they the and height of fashion? Eels. Yes, they were the height of fashion. Did you look the bee's knees? Oh, yes, definitely. How did you get from uh, Bristol to Street in those On days? On a bus. Is that how you came to? No, we drive. My husband, we oh. drove. Switching to cars and buses instead of trains was all part of a changing Britain. Though for Esther and Tina, coming from the Caribbean to a Bristol still recovering from war, change seemed painfully slow. When you arrived from Jamaica, did Bristol strike you as glamorous or not? No, we thought, coming down on the train, we thought all the houses were factories because there was smoke coming out of the chimneys. During the war, all the place was bombed then, you know. What was life like for you when you first arrived? Oh, it was horrendous for me. I just felt like I could just get the next ship and go back home, really. You know, you go, you work in the town, why don't you go back to where you come from and... What have you not? Oh, it was awful. Well, I remember ringing up about a house of, that was renting. 
I spoke to the lady about the house and she said, yes, it was vacant. Yes, you could come and have a look at it. And she take one look at me and see that I was black. She ran round to the back of the house and this man come out and said to me, oh, it's all gone. You faced prejudice? Yes, a lot of that. Bristol was a bomb site. It was smoky. Uh, obviously, the weather was terrible compared with the Caribbean. What brought you? Because they were short of nurses, they were short of railway people. There were so many jobs. You could just walk out of this one and walk into another because there were so many jobs. And people didn't worry about what you did before. They just want to get you to come in and start working for them. Esther and Tina's reflections are a fascinating insight into Britain in the mid-1960s. In spite of the racial prejudice that they and others experienced, there were jobs galore in a growing economy. The Labour Party's leader, Harold Wilson, had set the tone three years earlier when he called for a new Britain to be forged in the white heat of a technological and scientific revolution. Wasn't it therefore inevitable that the Somerset and Dorset, a railway with a foot in the past, would be one of the many lines recommended for closure in 1963 by Dr Beeching. Chris Austin and Richard Faulkner have written extensively about the politics behind the closure programme. Was it not reasonable to assume that the rail network that had grown up in Victorian times, higgledy-piggledy at a time when there weren't decent roads and, of course, no motor buses and no private cars, wasn't it reasonable to assume that that could not survive in the late 20th century when there were buses and cars? Yes, that is, that's a perfectly fair point to make. But what we found when we were researching our two books was that there were so many hasty decisions taken which removed the railway's capacity to contribute to the nation's transport. I've discovered that this railway was deeply adored. So presumably, when the closure was announced, the people of Somerset and Dorset, and indeed others, didn't take it lying down. Not at all, no. There were, there were huge protests. Uh, the line had a special characteristic of its own, and it did have a lot of supporters who were out there in the last days uh, filming um, almost endlessly. Uh, Richard, now this is slightly puzzling to me, because you are, and I used to be, a parliamentarian, and politicians don't like to take unpopular decisions. With this adored Somerset and Dorset railway line being so popular, why didn't the politicians stop it? Because within months of these closures going ahead in 1965, uh, Labour won a landslide victory of the 1966 election. So it would appear that railway closures were not an issue which bothered the voters in most parts of the country. They were intensely important to local people on their own lines. But as, an, as a national policy, it wasn't one that did the Labour Party any harm. The closure of the S&D was announced in late 1965, but delayed because of a problem with replacement bus services. The last trains ran on the weekend of March the 6th, 1966. But as with many steam railways around the country, it wasn't the end of the line. This is a heart-rending photograph of Midsummer Norton Station taken in 1983 and it's virtually ceased to exist. But look at it now. There's been an extraordinary resurrection. The station with its beautiful signal box has risen from the ashes, thanks to an enormous amount of work by a very dedicated group of people. A team of volunteers has spent decades restoring the station. They've got a diesel running on a mile of track that they've relayed, and they've rebuilt the signal box complete with its greenhouse, as they were before the line closed. And today I'm invited to put the finishing touches to a coach that they've spent years restoring. So I have the honour of applying this fantastic emblem to the coach. 
And the idea is not to botch this up, isn't it? I'm sure you'll do fine. Though. The important thing is to get it straight. So I've got a little chalk mark here. This is just like applying a transfer to your old model plane or train or whatever. It's superbly old-fashioned, isn't it? Lovely. And of course, it, it needs to embellish this coach, doesn't it? It certainly does. And there we are with the lion, the crown and the locomotive wheel. Makes you proud. And so it should. What the volunteers at Midsummer Norton are doing tells you a lot about how highly the railway was regarded in its heyday. Following its defunct course, I've travelled by bicycle, by bus, and by Bentley. But now, at the very end of my journey, at last, a real S&D experience. All right, it's a little bit on the small side, but the important point is that it's steam. This tight curve is bringing us onto the old track bed of the original line. The driver is John Gartell. When the line closed, his father bought this section of track and John keeps on adding to it. He just can't help it. You must have invested a portion of your fortune and a lot of your life in this railway. Why? I ask myself that time and time again. And if you ask my wife, she'd ask you the same thing as well. <laughs> but you must have got a lot of fun. A lot of fun out of it. A lot of fun enjoyment, yeah. It's good to see that, like many other railway lines axed by Dr. Beeching, the S&D is still giving joy to people 50 years on. But its purpose is strictly pleasure. And maybe that's how it should be. The Somerset and Dorset was clearly a much-loved railway, and still today its loss is mourned, even though, puffing its way up steep gradients and around tight curves, it was nicknamed the Slow and Dirty. That could be a metaphor for England in the 1960s. The pace of life was gentler, and Britain was populated with coal mines and smokestack industries where workers risked their lives. It's easy to be nostalgic, but Britain then was more deferential, poorer, less equal, and less liberal. And those days have had their last puff. Next month, the BBC is staging a special event to recreate England's World Cup victory at Wembley, 50 years to the day. Tune in to your BBC local radio station tomorrow to find out how you could be there. I'm a Norton. The year is remembered with a sense of loss. Their beloved railway that connected the Bristol Channel with the English Channel was closed. Since then, there's been an outpouring of literature and song commemorating the lost line, born on a wave of nostalgia for a way of life that passed into history. I want to discover, was there a kind of England that died along with the Somerset and Dorset Railway? From Green Park Station, the greenest mode of transport.
When people heard that the railway was to close in March 1966, amateur filmmakers came from far and wide to document the s and I've uncovered some of their shots that best convey the character and charm of the line. In 2013, the section from Bath to the first two tunnels became Bath, they built Green Park Station with a lovely facade worthy of this magnificent Georgian city and a fantastic wrought iron and glass single span roof. And today it still feels like a railway station with the single difference that there are no trains. And so if I'm going to follow the Somerset and Dorset, I'm going to need some wheels. And so to begin my journey from the S and D, as it was known, was always a railway for work and play. It moved local produce like coal, shoes, and stone, as well as people. Many of them going on holiday. It was a through line to Bournemouth. For many people in the west of England, 1966 was a stimulating year of change. In Bristol, Concord went into full production. Bob Dylan was shocking audiences at the Colston Hall. And in June, the Labour Party won a general election. And of course, it was the year of the Football World Cup. But for some people in Bath and Bournemouth, Glastonbury, Templecombe and Midsummer.